La Grande Inondation est un film britannique de Tony Mitchell avec Robert Carlyle, Jess Allen Gizig, David Suchet et Tom Courtenay. Une tempête extraordinaire fait rage au large de l'Écosse. A la surprise des météorologues, sa trajectoire change et elle se dirige vers l'estuaire de la Tamise qu'elle atteint à marée haute. Né de la superposition des ondes de la tempête et de la marée d'équinoxe, un mascaret colossal remonte le fleuve en direction de Londres. Ce phénomène est tellement exceptionnel qu'il n'a pas été pris en compte dans la conception de l'un des plus fameux dispositifs de protection contre les inondations au monde, la barrière sur la Tamise. Alors que les pouvoirs publics et la population se croyaient protégés par la barrière, Londres court à la catastrophe. Steve East est le chef d'équipe du support technique ainsi que le principal opérateur de la véritable barrière. Ses fonctions dans la vraie vie sont comparables à celles du personnage de Samantha Morrison dans le film. Nous l'avons confronté à la grande inondation. The flood is a, a work of fiction and therefore from the uh, factual point of view uh, we couldn't have too much input into it because we'd be saying to them well that doesn't happen in reality. So we uh, basically provided guidance on, on simple things such as what people might wear when they come to work here. Uh, and also, of course, we then facilitated some of the external shots that could only really be done uh, on the real structure. So the helicopter shots, for example, that were, were filmed here. The barrier in concept is quite simple. It puts a wall of steel right across the river here at Charlton, 520 meters in width. How that's delivered is a little bit more complex, but it still uses um, traditional uh, engineering techniques, civil engineering, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering to deliver that wall of steel using 10 separate gates that go right across the river. And we need that to stop the threat to London from tidal flooding. Uh, and tidal flooding is something that has always threatened London over the centuries, uh, but a risk that's increasing uh, as time goes on. Nos équipes inspectent les lieux toute l'année. On teste la fermeture une fois par mois. Et puis on manœuvre au moins une porte chaque jour, sans exception. C'est réglé comme une horloge. En dehors des tests, combien de fermetures dues au mauvais temps 21 l'an dernier. Dans les années 80, on devait en faire, je ne sais pas moi, une par an, mais... Avec l'élévation du niveau des océans et un climat de moins en moins prévisible, il y en a eu 26, 27. The threat to London these days is um, uh, a threat that's existed over the centuries, but it's now getting worse. It's getting worse for a number of reasons. The southeast of England is still tipping into the sea due to post-glacial recovery, so that's where the weight of ice from the last ice age has been released, and the country is now rewriting itself from that heavy uh, uh, weight. And so one or two millimetres a year, southeast continues to sink into the sea. Secondly, the river's a lot narrower now than it was, say, in Roman times, when it was probably three times the width it was in central London. So there's less room for the water to actually flow into London. Um, and thirdly, climate change. We know that average mean sea level rise is occurring and that each year there is, again, one or two millimetres adding to the, the profile of the Uh, level of water in the river. That's the reason that the threat is increasing. In reality, the need to use the barrier is then further impacted by more specific factors, not the generic. Ma simulation prévoit maintenant que l'onde de tempête et la tempête atteindront l'estuaire de la Tamise à marée haute, ce qui signifie que le volume d'eau qui se déplacera vers l'amont va se trouver énormément amplifié. Well, Leonard's right in, in what he said, um, because the factors that we're really interested in here at the barrier are a surge occurring on a high spring tide. And if those two things coincide, it could well be that we need to use the barrier. What happens in the film when those two things coincide is where fiction and fact separate. Well, in the film, of course, you see a, a tidal wave coming up the river, uh, and, and that just wouldn't happen. The barrier itself gives a phenomenal level of protection to London. It protects against a one in 1,000 year flood event in the year 2030. That's the design criteria. And we've recently undertaken research that suggests to us that the actual level of protection we're currently providing is way in excess of that. To give you a, an idea, 
the terrible floods of 1953, where 300 people lost their lives uh, in England and 3,000 in Holland, was a one in 300 year event. Now, of course, in those days, they didn't have the warning systems, they didn't have the defences that we have today, and therefore that contributed to the loss of life. But that very rare event was only one in 300. The bar barrier is designed to protect against a one in a thousand, and we know in reality, because sea level rise was built into the design criteria, the actual level of protection that London enjoys is even greater than that, world class. Well, as far as the barrier being overridden, I suppose you can never say never, but the statistical probability and the history of the Thames over the centuries suggests that the barrier will never be compromised by overtopping. The barrier is a hugely robust structure. The large steel gates, the 61 metre main navigation spans, weigh 3,300 tonnes each. And that's the equivalent to over six fully laden super jumbo jets. So that's the sort of weight we're talking about with our large steel gates. We've got four of those big ones. We've had a ship drive straight into the barrier. The ship sank, the barrier didn't move half a millimetre. So it's a hugely robust structure. So any depiction that the barrier structure itself is vulnerable uh, to a wave, uh, I think to say the least, is highly exaggerated. Je dois rejoindre mon équipe. J'y vais. Sam, restez où vous êtes. J'y vais avec Frank. Non, non. Pas le temps de discuter, Sam. Allons-en. The representation of the inside of the barrier is fairly accurate in the film. Um, some of the key components were replicated on, on the set in South Africa uh, and look quite similar to the actual structure. Other parts don't look as similar, particularly some of the, the access ways. Um, but it's a, it's a fa it gives a fairly good indication of the, the inside of the barrier. And the external shots that weren't filmed here are, are very, very accurate indeed in appearance. Donc la tempête a déversé quasiment 100 mm de pluie en amont, ce qui a fait considérablement grossir la tamise et ses écluses, toute menace de céder. Pour empêcher l'onde de tempête de remonter plus loin sur le fleuve, je crois qu'on doit ouvrir toutes les portes des écluses, ce qui fait que toute cette eau se déversera avec force vers l'aval. I think when we reach the part of the film when they talk about alleviating the flood that's gone into London, then we're really into the realms of fantasy. Uh, the science just doesn't stack up, the logic doesn't stack up, the equipment such as the sluice gates that they quote just doesn't stack up in reality. Mais si nous ouvrons les vannes des écluses, ne va-t-on pas justement relâcher davantage d'eau dans la zone inondable Bien sûr, mais si nous avons un timing précis, comme la barrière sera ouverte, toute l'eau des écluses va contrecarrer cette masse d'eau. Et la marée descendante va l'entraîner avec elle jusqu'à l'estuaire. So I think by then, if you hadn't already suspended uh, belief, uh, and, and realise that you're watching a uh, disaster movie purely for entertainment purposes, uh, then at that point, that's the time to, uh, to, to, to accept that. Il faut vider la salle de verrouillage pour activer les bras hydrauliques qui ouvrent la barrière. Mais même si on arrive jusqu'à la salle du passage en mode manuel, les moteurs antiterroristes de la barrière se déclencheront et il ne sera plus possible d'en sortir. Pour que le système de pompage fonctionne, il faut aussi que la salle soit verrouillée de l'intérieur. Ce qui veut dire que quiconque entrera dans cette salle manquera d'air avant que la porte soit rouverte de l'autre côté. The barrier itself is built around reliability and resilience. So we have backup systems to all our major uh, pieces of equipment. So if we lose power from one place, we switch to another. If we lose it from the second place, we switch to another. We've got various ways of moving the gates in position. We've got various um, places on the barrier where we can instruct those gates to move, to move using the control system. So whenever we have a, a, an important system that is backed up and usually backed up and backed up and backed up. So there are many ways of using the barrier. We don't have to put anybody in danger as they do in the film to operate any one of those key systems. Morrison is a researcher, specialist of the environment. He has also been an analyst of the Centre de Recherche, Risk and Inundation, a member of a commission parliamentary charged to do a report on the placement of the barrier. The report he presented highlighted a major defect. 
D'après lui, la barrière était située au mauvais endroit. Et il a conseillé qu'elle soit construite plus près de l'estuaire de la Tamise, plus près de la mer. En gros, ce qui l'inquiétait, c'était le fait que dans certaines conditions de marée, la barrière serait obligatoirement submergée. The barrier is located here at Charlton for a number of reasons. Firstly, the geological conditions were suitable for foundations. When you think that the foundations of the barrier go 17 metres into the riverbed, then that was obviously a factor. Secondly, by building the barrier where it is, uh, not too far down uh, the river, fairly close to central London, uh, it obviously means you can have a shorter barrier, because the further downstream you get, the wider the river gets. So here, a 520 metre barrier compared to thousands of metres of barrier that you might need, for example, at the estuary. And thirdly, the Thames is a very windy river. And here, on either side of the barrier, we get a nice straight run for shipping approaching the structure from a navigational viewpoint. So all those factors combine to make this the ideal location. Now, at some point in the future, it might well be that we'll need a second Thames barrier, um, because this one uh, will be at the end of its effective life, or the rises in sea level mean that there's a risk of overtopping it. We don't know that yet. Um, the data suggests that in perhaps 90 years' time, that may be a reality. And I think in 90 years' time, say, if there is a second Thames barrier, that will indeed be further downstream. Whether that would be used in conjunction with this barrier, we don't know at this stage, or whether it would be a totally independent barrier. All those decisions are going to have to be made in the future when we know how sea level rise has actually impacted as opposed to the potential that we're currently forecasting. Um, the Thames Estuary 2100 project has actually developed a plan to cope with different sea level scenarios in the future and it gives a whole range of options as for how we will manage flood, the flood risk in the whole Thames Estuary in the future and depending on when certain levels are reached th at that stage there will be the cost benefit the economic the social political decisions to be made by the future generations as to how they want to best manage that flood risk but the Thames Estuary 2100 plan gives them the information that they'll need to make those decisions in the future uh, what we do know, our responsibility, is to make sure that this structure remains effective and operational at least until 2070, as opposed to 2030, which was the original design criteria. Alors, quelles sont les zones qui sont le plus menacées? La zone à risque comprend les Docklands Light Railways, 68 stations de métro, 30 gares de grande ligne. Et comme vous allez pouvoir le voir, trois sites classés au patrimoine mondial, deux centrales électriques, des douzaines de musées et puis des galeries d'art et aussi bien sûr l'endroit où vous êtes. Whitehall. I think the real benefit to the Environment Agency of the film was to use the media publicity around the film to get out some of our key messages about flooding, about what the actual flood risk is, not only from tidal flooding, but fluvial flooding, flooding groundwater flooding, surface water flooding, etc. Uh, and also to tell people what they can do about it, that you can plan for a flood, you can have a flood plan, you can find out what risk your property is at. Um, you just go on the internet now and you look up uh, the risk to your property. The fact that you need to have insurance cover uh, for your property uh, and that in your own circumstances you can do a lot to protect yourself and so the film was a great opportunity uh, for us to, uh, to, to use the publicity around it to get out those messages uh, about real life situations as opposed to fictional ones. I think the film is quite a lot of fun, um, I think it, it's quite entertaining in quite a cheesy way, uh, I don't think it'll ever win any BAFTAs and certainly won't win any Oscars. But when it comes on television from time to time, because it gets repeated quite a lot, I might spend another half an hour watching it. Uh, and I do think some of the shots of the barrier are quite spectacular. I know a lot of it is CGI, but some of the helicopter shots uh, that show the barrier for real, uh, I think show, shows the barrier for an iconic structure uh, that it is in reality.